Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kodrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a TLC, Thin Layer Chromatography, of Analgesic Drugs Experiment. This is part one, the pre-lab. The learning objectives for this experiment are described on this slide. At the end of this experiment you'll be able to explain how chromatography works to separate molecules, describe the mobile and stationary phases in TLC, explain why molecules move up a TLC plate at different rates, You'll be able to prepare and develop a TLC plate containing spots of analgesic drugs. Those are pain relievers. You'll be able to visualize the plate and calculate RF values, that stands for retention factor, of the spots. You'll be able to identify a pure unknown analgesic drug by comparison to authentic standards. And you'll be able to identify the analgesics present in an unknown mixture by comparing those to authentic standards as well. The prerequisites for this experiment include a basic knowledge of Lewis structures, it also helps to have an understanding of the polarity of bonds and molecules. A knowledge of intermolecular force types is also really important. So van der Waals attractive forces, dipole-dipole attractive forces, and hydrogen bonding are all concepts that will be important for understanding how TLC works. This slide covers safety in today's experiment. Ethanol and acetone are flammable and volatile solvents. You should keep these away from sources of ignition and avoid breathing the vapors. Dichloromethane is also known as methylene chloride, that's CH2Cl2. It's a volatile solvent that is a suspected carcinogen. You should avoid skin contact with this solvent and also avoid its vapors. Work with adequate ventilation. Ceric ammonium molybdate stain is corrosive and irritating. Avoid skin contact with this material. Then we'll be using shortwave radiation today to visualize spots. This is harmful to tissue. Wear gloves and don't let it shine on your skin. Finally, the analgesics in today's experiment are irritants, so avoid skin contact with these. This slide introduces the concept of chromatography. Chromatography is a family of techniques that are used to separate mixtures of molecules. To understand chromatography, think of the way these tubes are floating down this rocky river. The tubes get pulled downstream by the flowing water and they bump into rocks along the way that slows their progress. The tubes move down the river at different rates based on the way that they interact with the rocks along the way. Some of the tubes will get held back more and they'll progress more slowly. For example, look at this big clump of tubes here up against this rock. This clump is likely to move a lot slower than this other clump, which is less likely to get held up by the rocks. So they move down the river at different rates. If you imagine that the tubes are like molecules, this will give you a sense of how chromatography works. The molecules move between two phases here. One's called a mobile phase, which moves, that would be analogous to the water. And there's a stationary phase that stays still. This is analogous to the rocks in the river. So a mixture of molecules is pushed through the stationary phase by the mobile phase, and different molecules in the mixture interact differently with the stationary phase on their way through it. Some of the compounds adhere more strongly to the stationary phase, and those are held back more, while there are others that adhere less strongly and move more rapidly. So molecules have different mobilities through the stationary phase. Thin layer chromatography, or TLC, is one specific type of chromatography, and it'll be the first one we look at. The stationary phase in TLC is a powdery solid called silica gel that's coated onto a thin layer of plastic foil or a glass plate. Here's a diagram of a chromatography plate. They're usually rectangular. The stationary phase silica gel is very polar. This diagram shows what a silica gel particle might look like. The important thing is that the surface is covered in OH groups which are very polar. These form strong hydrogen bonds with molecules that contain oxygen or nitrogen lone pairs. They can also form dipole-dipole interactions with other molecules that are strong as well. So polar molecules stick more strongly to silica gel, whereas nonpolar molecules stick less strongly and would move faster through it. The mobile phase in TLC is a solvent. The way it works is a mixture of compounds is spotted at the bottom of the plate. Usually people will draw reference lines at the bottom and top of the plate to mark the starting and ending locations of the movement. A mixture of compounds is spotted at the bottom of the plate, and the plate is placed in a shallow pool of solvent which then wicks up the plate by capillary action. This gets put in a beaker, and as the mobile phase climbs up, the spots are carried along at different rates, and you can see here the red spot and the blue spot moving apart from each other. Then the beaker is removed, and the solvent evaporates, and we're left with a plate that has these two separated spots. The spots moved up the plate at different rates based on their affinity for the stationary phase. The more polar a compound is, the more strongly it will adhere to the silica gel and the slower it will move. So in this example, the blue spot is more polar than the red spot. The blue spot was held back more, and it has a lower mobility on silica gel. This slide describes preparing a TLC plate. 
When you get a TLC plate, be sure to handle it by the edges to avoid smudging it. We'll be using the dull silica gel coated side of the plate. The shiny side of the plate is the plastic backing. You'll want to draw ledger lines lightly in pencil. Don't use pen because pen will smear. And we'll draw them about one centimeter from the top and one centimeter from the bottom. Then draw hash marks lightly in pencil across the bottom ledger line to mark where your spots are going to be placed. So there are these two subtle lines here that just got drawn. That's where we're going to put our spots. Then label below each hash mark in pencil, A, B, C, or some other labeling system so that you can keep track of the spots. These are being labeled A and B. Next we'll describe preparing micropipettes to put the spots on the plate. This will be described in detail in the video describing how to carry out the experiment, but this is a discussion of how it works. Start with a Bunsen burner flame, then get a piece of capillary tubing, grip it on its ends, and hold it in the hot part of the Bunsen burner flame. The tube will get orange hot and get soft in the middle, kind of like a wet spaghetti noodle. Then you want to remove the tube from the flame and immediately pull it apart after it's out. The tube will get elongated in the middle, and it'll look something like this. If we break this elongated tube in the middle, that'll give us two micropipettes. These can be used to spot TLC plates. To spot the TLC plate, dip a clean micropipette into the solution you want to spot. The solution will get sucked up into the pipette by capillary action. Then lightly touch the micropipette to the plate at the hash mark. The solution will flow out leaving a spot on the plate. The solvent will evaporate quickly and will leave an invisible spot in today's experiment because the analgesics that we're looking at are colorless. Here's what it might look like. The spot lays down on the plate and you see the solvent for a little bit but it evaporates quickly. Place the TLC plate under a UV lamp to view the spot. These spots aren't visible under normal light. The TLC plate contains a fluorescent indicator that'll glow under UV light and the spots will be visible. Spot it again if needed. Ideally, the spots should be about two millimeters in diameter and you'll need to spot all the solutions in their appropriate lanes with a clean micropipette. In today's experiment, we're gonna analyze five solutions. So put five hash marks on the plate and label them with letters A through E. Spot each lane with a different solution using a clean micropipette. Here's a suggested labeling scheme. A for acetaminophen standard, that'll be provided. B for an aspirate standard, that'll also be provided. C for caffeine, D for ibuprofen, and E for your unknown solution, which you'll have to make up. You're gonna need to check your TLC plate before developing to make sure the spots are visible. The TLC plate doesn't show any spots under normal light because the spots are colorless but under UV light, the spots will appear as a dark circle or on a green background. When you shine a UV lamp on the plate, it should look something like this with the dark blue spots at the baseline. Make sure all the spots are dark and clearly visible. If any of the spots are faint and difficult to see, spot them again with another coat. To develop the plate, get a beaker and place filter paper along the side. This will function as a wick for solvent and keep the atmosphere inside the developing chamber saturated with solvent vapor. Next we'll add solvent, but make sure that the solvent level won't touch the spots, so it needs to be a shallow pool of solvent that's going to be below the level of the spots. Then place the plate in the chamber and cover it with a watch glass. This will keep the solvent from evaporating. The solvent will wick up the plate by capillary action, and the spots will move up the plate, but this won't be visible under normal light. We'll remove the plate from the chamber and allow it to air dry. Then we'll visualize the plate under UV light. Shine a UV lamp on the plate and see the location of the spots. Then mark those locations in pencil, and remember the UV lamp is hazardous to tissue, so wear gloves when you're handling the plate under UV light. When you take the plate out of the UV lamp, you'll be able to see the spot locations, and that's important for the next part of the experiment. Take your mark plate back to your bench and then calculate RF values, retention factors. RF value retention factor is a ratio of two distances, D1 and D2, and it's unitless. The first distance is the distance that the spot travels from the baseline. We're looking at spot E here. Measure the distance that D1 traveled from the baseline at the middle of the spot. Then measure distance D2. That's the progress of the solvent front from the point at which the spot started to the point where the solvent progress ended. The RF value of the spot E then is the ratio of these two distances, D1 divided by D2. Use the same units for each a distance measurement so that they cancel out and the ratio is a unitless number. Some of the lanes may contain multiple spots, which indicates that multiple compounds are present in that particular material. Calculate and record the RF value of every spot you see in each lane. 
Next, we're going to stain the developed plate. We'll stain the plate using a ceric ammonium molybdate or cam stain. This can be useful for distinguishing spot types. Some spots stain differently, and this will allow you to distinguish them. This is particularly useful in situations where RF values are very close. Like on this plate, the top two spots have a very similar RF value, and if they stained differently, that would be helpful for distinguishing them. Grip the plate with a tweezer and then dip it in the stain solution, but don't let the stain touch the tweezer, so only dip it in up to the dotted line. If you touch the tweezer, sometimes that catalyzes a reaction where the entire plate turns blue, and that's a problem. Dab the excess stain off the back of the plate with a paper towel, and then heat the plate using a hot air gun until spots appear. Here's an example of what a plate might look like. Some of the spots here have turned blue, another one of the spots has turned kind of a rusty red-brown color. Some of the spots appear as colored dots, while others may not. This differential staining can be used to distinguish them. In this example, the spots A and E have the same RF value, but they clearly are different because they have different staining abilities. This isn't exactly what you're going to see in today's experiment, but it'll be pretty close. That's the end of the pre-lab lecture. Stay tuned for the next video in the series, which will cover carrying out the experiment. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.